does formaldehyde do all this? So formaldehyde can form crosslinks between proteins and proteins and proteins and DNA and proteins and RNA, basically sticking these things together. So it can like capture their interactions. And we use it for all sorts of things. Like we can isolate those where like DNA and pro RNA proteins are bound and then like sequence it. So things like ChIP-seq or RIP-seq, there's a bunch of different uh, varieties. But basically you cross-link the protein to the DNA or the RNA and then you isolate that and you sequence it and you see where it's bound. We also use formaldehyde just to cross-link things together for like structural biology purposes, which is what I was using it for um, during the week. I was trying it out to try to stabilize a complex between a protein and RNA. We also use formaldehyde to like fix um, fix like tissue samples or cell samples. Um, so basically like freeze things so that you can then stick in some dye um, and label specific things and that sort of things. Formaldehyde is used for like embalming and stuff because it can cross link all of these proteins and stuff together so that they're not just gonna be like decomposing and falling apart and all of this stuff. But how does it do it? If you look at a molecule formaldehyde, it's like a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and two hydrogens, that's it. That's it. How's it doing it? How's it doing it? How's it connecting all of these things? And so I was really curious and so I looked into it and I want to show you what I found. So I don't have a bunch of text today, um, be, but I will um, post links to some of the papers that helped me figure this out. This is formaldehyde. As I said, not very interesting looking. It does not look like it would be able to do much of anything but um, it can. And so formaldehyde, so the aldehyde, it's the simplest aldehyde. So an aldehyde is where you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, double bonded to a hydrogen. Um, and so it's one of the key like functional groups um, or groups of atoms that tend to form these common um, like repeating things that we see over and over in um, chemistry and biochemistry where together they have special functions. Um, and we can predict like what type of reactions that molecules that have these functional groups will react in. And so one thing about the aldehyde is that this oxygen is highly um, electronegative. And so it's going to be pulling electron density away from the carbon. So these, are, these atoms are joined together by sharing pairs of electrons. And much more on this in other posts, I'm not going to go into that. Um, here, but basically they're sharing pairs of electrons. The oxygen is hogging them more. And so this is making the carbon partly electron deficient. Um, and so therefore it's wanting electrons. It's electrophilic. Um, now it's vulnerable to attack by things that are nucleophilic. And so a nucleophile is the opposite of an electrophile. A nucleophile has more electrons than it can comfortably handle. So it can attack an electrophile. And so you can get this thing called nucleophilic attack. And that's what we're going to see in our formaldehyde cross-linking. You can have this carbon as electrophilic because it's having this oxygen pulled away. And this is going to make it vulnerable to attack from nucleophiles. We can find nucleophiles in various places, and we can find them in a lot of places in proteins and in DNA and RNA. So with nucleic acids, they can occur in these base parts that stick out. Um, so in these, the nitrogens, in these um, amine and imine, um, uh, amino and imino groups, um, they can so serve as nucleophiles. Um, and then and proteins, you can have it um, in the nitrogen amino groups at the C terminus, or in some of the, more commonly in some of these like backbone groups, or these, some of these R groups or side chains, um, the unique parts that stick off from the amino acids. And one of the most common um, ones that is, does the formaldehyde cross-linking the most is lysine. And so lysine, we show it here in its protonated state. When it deprotonates, then it has a lone pair of electrons on its nitrogen and it's highly nucleophilic and um, can readily attack um, the formaldehyde. So you might think, okay, so what is, how is that going to do anything? And so before we had talked, when we talked about cross-linking the other day, when we were talking about like protein-protein cross-linking um, and how I was trying to use it in the lab. Um, 
so one of the things that I was talking about was this like this linker molecule called DSG. And so DSG is like a common, um, what we call it's like a bifunctional, bifunctional linker, hetero bifunctional linker or whatever. Um, but basically it has like two hands. And I talked about how you could think of the hands as kind of like mouse traps. Um, and so you have mouse traps on either side and then you have this linker in between. And so one mouse trap can attack and then the other mouse and get stuck on one thing and then the, it's the other mouse trap can attack and get stuck on the other thing and then you have them cross-linked together and you can do things um, like try to figure out where the cross-links are. But if we look at formaldehyde, how the heck is this going to do anything? And it turns out that um, you can get two subsequent attacks that are going to lead to the molecules being linked together through a single carbon um, linker formed through the, um, the formaldehyde. And because you only have the single carbon as opposed to a longer linker, this is going to um, potentially give you more um, specific binding because they have to be in closer contact in order for this to happen. So here is like the basic mechanism. Um, and so basically you're gonna have two sequential nucleophilic attacks of that electrophilic carbon that's coming from the formaldehyde. Um, and so this can occur um, in mul through multiple places. You have nucleophiles from multiple places. Um, and so this uh, figure from this paper that I'll link to. Um, so they were showing like you have these cross links between cysteine, um, histidine, tryptophan, lysine. Um, Lysine is the most common, which is um, for a few reasons, it's like the most nucleophilic with the um, nitrogen. And then it also, um, practically it is most likely to cross-link when you're talking about like DNA protein interactions because so lysine is very hydrophilic. Um, so water likes it, it likes water. It tends to be found on the outside of proteins. So it also tends to be positively charged and the backbone of DNA is negatively charged. Um, and so opposite charges attract. And so lysine tends to be involved in like um, binding to DNA. And so they're already in close proximity. You've got this lysine that likes to react. And so it's going to react. And so theoretically you could have your like DNA RNA acting as the, nucle the first nucleophile, so you're gonna have two nucleophilic attacks. Um, but typically it's like the light, the proteins are typically like the lysine is going to attack first because it's the most nucleophilic. One reason that the DNA is less likely to like attack first and stuff um, when you have to be like, when it has to be like a stronger nucleophile um, is that the bases are resonance stabilized. So basically there's like communal electron sharing around those rings and that's going to make um, those base nitrogens um, less nucleophilic than um, say the lysine, which doesn't have that. And is so it can more readily attack formaldehyde. And then once you have that attack and then later you have that intermediate that is more electrophilic and then you don't need as strong of a nucleophile. And so you can get this, um, the you know, lysine acting first and then the DNA acting second. Um, but there are other places that this can happen as well. And so when it attacks, um, so you, the first nucleophile is going to attack that electrophilic carbon. Um, and so the electrons are going to get pushed onto the oxygen. Um, <clears throat> now you have this weird separation of charges things that, um, that molecules don't really like. Um, so you're going to get this proton transfer. So you're going to see this proton is going to come here from this hydrogen to this oxygen, but it's not going to like directly just like hop over. Like water helps um, with these types of reactions. So water can like give and take a proton to become like an ion or whatever and pass it. And, but basically you end up with this methyl all addict. Um, so the all for the alcohol. Um, and then this can rearrange to a shift base. Um, and We've talked about shift bases in the past, but basically they have this nitrogen double bonded to a carbon. And so this is actually the cation form. Um, and so basically they, um, 
this carbon, just like we saw when it was bound to an oxygen, because the oxygen was electronegative, the carbon became electrophilic. Nitrogen is also electronegative. Um, and so it's going to be, this carbon is going to be electrophilic, especially because this nitrogen is really wanting some electrons right now because it's down on them. So this carbon is going to be electrophilic and now it's going to be vulnerable to uh, an attack from a nucleophile. And so now this nucleophile can come from the, another protein, come from a same protein, but in a different place. It can come from DNA, it can come from RNA. There's all sorts of places that this nucleophile can come from. But for this example, we're going to use the most common um, crosslink that's found is the slicing to um, guanine. Um, and so this uh, nitrogen can attack that electrophilic carbon, and then you're going to get some rearrangements and stuff similarly to how we saw rearrangements before, and you get this loss of water, and now you end up with this one carbon linker um, from formaldehyde. Um, so you've lost the OH part, like the O's and the H's, so you've lost the water part of formaldehyde, but you're left with this. Or, no, you haven't lost the H's. You've lost like the oxygen from this formaldehyde, um, but you haven't lost the hydrogens. Um, so you have this one carbon linker between the DNA um, and the pro or an RNA or protein. Um, and so now they're stuck together. And now you can do things like try to figure out um, where they're stuck together. But the pro a problem can be that you can then have, um, you're having protein-protein cross-linking as well as protein nucleic acid cross-linking. So if you want to do something like um, ChIP-seq or RIP-seq, where basically you're trying to, you cross-link a protein to, um, so with ChIP-seq or RIP-seq and all these um, there's like a ton of different varieties. Um, but basically the idea is that you cross-link a protein to nucleic acids. So you cross-link a um, protein to like DNA or RNA, then you um, chew up the RNA or the DNA around them, isolate the protein that you're interested in, such as with like immunoprecipitation or IP using um, an antibody, the little protein that's specific for the protein you're interested in to isolate that protein. Then you can reverse the cross-link and isolate and sequence the nucleic acid to see where it was bound. And then you can look and see if there's any like common motifs or whatever, like other sequences that it's normally binding. Um, maybe it's finding the specific genes and regulating those genes. So there's a bunch of different things that you can do. Um, and so, so formaldehyde um, can be used for this, but for RNA, we sent, um, it's more and more being used with like UV light during the cross-linking. Um, you can have, um, do it that way. Um, and so with formaldehyde, like these cross-links are reversible. Um, so if you're actually doing the um, formaldehyde cross-linking in the lab, as I found out the hard way, you don't wanna boil your samples if you're doing like an SCS page to see if the cross-linking actually cross-linked your, um, complex um, because it's going to reverse the cross links. Um, but when you're doing like chip seek, it's that's very helpful that you can reverse these cross links because that's going to allow you to then isolate and sequence the nucleic acid. There are also some really cool things like um, Parclip where they use modified like RNA bases that have these like photo activatable groups. Um, and so then the cross link is instead of cross-linking at, so normally with like formaldehyde or normal UV light, you're cross-linking in a way that's not going to, it's not going to change how the, the sequencer like reads it. Um, but with these other technologies, um, some of them, when they use the mod these modified bases and then um, the bases don't affect the, like the base pairing of the RNA, like when it's actually, like doing its job, but when it gets cross-linked, it's cross-linking in a position that's going to like then alter how the reverse copy of it is made or whatever when you're doing the reverse complementary strand and stuff. And so you'll get like this, um, the letter change will, the sequence will change, like the letter will be swapped um, when you sequence it and then you can tell that it was really bound there. So there's a bunch of really cool techniques to try to get better resolution as opposed to just like, so it's like single nucleotide resolution. So like where exactly was this protein bound? Um, 
but in general, so with like this chip sync or whatever, like it's still going, so it's going to, your resolution is going to depend on like how close to the protein like you chewed away and that sort of thing. Um, but so a problem could be with like formaldehyde is that you are cross-linking protein to protein as well. So even though you isolate one protein, if that protein is attached to another protein, then you're not going to know whether both proteins were actually bound directly to the sequence and that sort of thing. Um, whereas with like UV light, um, you are getting these protein-protein cross-link, you're getting like the protein RNA cross-links. Um, and so hopefully you have less of an issue with that. So yeah, as to how the RNA and uh, the photo-induced RNA protein cross-linking works, um, it's not, super well understood and it's not simple at all, um, but I found this preprint on Chem Archive, um, Structural Requirements of Photo-Induced RNA Protein Cross-Linking by Marlene et al. Um, and so I'll post links to it, um, but basically because you have that you have um, pi stacking, um, so you have like this base stacking. Um, so when you have these aromatic, um, resonance. Um, so like when you have these bases, you have this electron density like above and below because they're stabilized by resonance. Um, and this kind of energy stabilization and stuff um, lowers the barrier between different energy levels. So it can make them like absorb UV light and stuff. Um, and so then this can make them more susceptible to those things like um, photo-induced electron transfer. So with these bases, they have like resonance, they're resonance stabilized. And so they have like electron density like above and below. And so then when they're stacking, you can get photo-induced electron transfer. Um, so basically you give them this wavelength of energy that they like, and then you end up with these radical intermediates. So basically a radical is where you have a, a lone electron and they really don't like this. Um, and so then they're going to um, react to one another in order to join up because, so one basically gives an electron to the other um, and now they're both unhappy and then they're like, okay, we'll join up. Um, and so then they can join up and give you this cross link. Um, and yeah, so they have to be like really close and stuff and the base top to align. And so you have these requirements and so then you can get more specificity and stuff that way. So this is a really good article I found that um, helps explain things. Um, but basically what I wanted to show you now was that the, you typically don't want to like you typically like quench the reaction up. So you don't just like over cross link and have like a oodles of like just giant aggregates forming because you can remember you're forming protein, 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 DNA, protein, RNA. You could end up with like all of just, just like clumpy, like just everything stuck together in this like aggregate. You don't want that. Um, so you can quench the reaction. And so when I, like when I was doing it, I had a solution of tris and lysine and glycine and tried to give it a bunch of stuff that the formaldehyde can react with instead of reacting with the um, with my complex. And so you can see that basically if you have like glycine or tris, um, then you can get these quenching products where the formaldehyde is going to attack it instead of the end. Um, and you can see that with all of these like reaction arrows, they're reversible. Um, and so this is going to um, allow you to reverse it with like heat and stuff. And you can learn more about all of this um, and like the different rates of reversal and stuff in these, um, in these articles I found. And I'll share links too. I think they're all open access. Another note of caution is that formaldehyde can form cross links to itself. So it can form like these long chains. Um, of paraformaldehyde. And so if you want like actual formaldehyde um, and you're starting from paraformaldehyde, you have to like activate it. So you like heat it up in order to break up all of those um, cross links to get the separate formaldehyde molecules that you can then use. So um, fun fact, so formaldehyde, we often think of it as like this scary thing, um, but our bodies actually naturally make formaldehyde um, and like small amounts of it. And a paper from a few years ago showed that 
we can actually like use this formaldehyde for like it's carbon like it's part of like the one carbon cycle and we can like detoxify it and the same time like make dna and rna and stuff so it's pretty cool so yeah you don't want high levels of it um but it's like your the evidence is i was trying to figure out is um pretty limited as to the actual health effects of like but i mean like in laboratory animals and stuff it is known to be carcinogenic so it can cause cancer um but typically like at the levels that they're not you're not going to be exposed to formaldehyde at levels that are going to cause you danger and in fact the formaldehyde in your body you might be like making it yourself um but yeah so i thought that was pretty interesting um and just something that you don't really think about a lot is that your body's actually producing these things and so yeah so you don't like formaldehyde can be toxic and stuff because as we see it can like show do form these cross links and that sort of stuff but like the low levels of formaldehyde that we're either exposed to or that our bodies make itself um don't really seem to be a cause for concern but of course if you're working with formaldehyde like take precautions and everything and wear gloves and don't eat it or anything